In 2008, the state bank known as VEBRF provided major financing to build a chip factory in Zelenograd. The factory was planned to produce semiconductors at roughly the 130 nanometer process node. Angstrom T, the borrower, failed to establish a working production system for the plant. As a result, the loan grew with interest and penalties, reaching about 1.2 to 1.3 billion euros. The company declared bankruptcy, and the bank acquired the physical assets to cover the claim. The court approved this arrangement. The headline, One Ruble Purchase, Debt Erased, sounds dramatic, but to know if this was a disaster, a smart decision, or something else, we need to look at the original plan, what actually happened, where the equipment came from, and how other countries handle similar projects. A semiconductor factory, often called a fab, is very different from the typical factory most people imagine. A fab is made up of process engineers, clean rooms, chemical supply lines, and highly precise machines that turn silicon wafers into microchips. Two concepts matter most for non-specialists. First is the process node, which shows the smallest features the factory can produce, such as 130 nanometers, 65 nanometers, 28 nanometers, or even single-digit nanometers today. Second is yield, which is the number of usable chips that can be taken from a wafer after manufacturing. Fabs are not efficient right away. They need years of process improvements, strong ties with equipment and material suppliers, and constant investment to buy newer machines as the industry shifts to finer nodes. Building or reviving a fab is not just about putting up walls and switching on equipment. It requires creating an ecosystem and going through a long learning curve. That is why governments often step in since private investors see the risk and time involved as too great or too uncertain. The origin of Angstrom T's equipment is a key part of the story. It shows how the project tried to speed up development by buying secondhand machines and also how supply problems and delays hurt the plan. Reports say, Angstrom T bought 130 nanometer equipment originally used in an AMD plant in Dresden. Much of this gear was stored in Western warehouses for years, making installation and setup difficult later. By the time critical lithography tools arrived in Russia, the global market had already moved ahead. Some machines had sat idle for so long that they were outdated or hard to use. This delay was a major factor in the company's failure. The simple line, they purchased machines, hides a more complex truth. Buying used tools can save money, but it requires strong in-house engineering, a reliable supply chain, and fast integration. Long storage and delays reduce the value of the equipment. Politics and sanctions also played a big role. After 2018, Western restrictions made it harder for Angstrom T to buy, maintain, or upgrade Western-made machines and materials. The bank saw rising risks, and the factory never earned enough to service its loans. At one stage, the company was only able to work at about 250 nanometers, instead of the promised 130 nanometers. The state bank became the main creditor, and then, after bankruptcy, the owner, the court ruling shows the policy choice to keep these assets under national control instead of letting them be sold off or liquidated. This meant writing off a very large amount on paper. What does this mean for Russia's microelectronics strategy? On one side, the state has kept the site and hardware safe and blocked foreign buyers from taking them. Older nodes like 130 nanometers still have uses in defense and industrial systems, so this is not pointless. On the other side, the case shows a bigger weakness. A strong semiconductor industry needs constant improvements, skilled engineers, supplier networks, and clear long-term plans. Owning old machines without that culture and system is not the same as running a true foundry that can grow into finer nodes. The one-ruble deal may buy time and sovereignty, but the real challenge is building capabilities training talent, and improving yields. That takes money, patience, and years of effort. It helps to compare Russia with two other state-led strategies. 
China took a top-down approach, heavily funding domestic champions such as Nike and many suppliers. It tied industrial policy with finance and procurement, creating a market for its fabs while they learned and scaled up. The cost was huge, and China still struggles at the cutting edge, where only a few global players control key tools and patents. But China now has a solid base across many process nodes. India took another path. Instead of directly building state-owned fabs, it focused on incentives under the India Semiconductor Mission. The goal is to attract private fabs, design houses and packaging plants by using public funds to bring in private money. India relies on its strengths in design talent and services, building an ecosystem step by step. Both models teach the same lesson. Government money is needed, but it is not enough alone. For Russia, the next stage must go beyond moving assets around on paper. If the Angstrom site is to become productive, there must be clear goals about which process nodes to target, technical leaders to guide progress, partnerships for upgrades and service, and efforts to grow local suppliers and engineers. The state's ownership solves the immediate financial pressure, but it does not create the innovations that improve yields or allow modern production. The one-ruble deal ends one chapter, but begins another. The real test is whether Russia can turn saved hardware into a patient, long-term technical program. For non-specialists, the lessons are simple. Buying machines is only the first step in chip making, which is one of the hardest industries in the world. Angstrom T failed because it depended on second-hand gear from AMD's old Dresden Fab, long delays, and later Western sanctions. The state's choice to take over the site and cancel the debt protects sovereignty, but it does not guarantee technology progress. China and India show that there are different ways to build a national chip industry, but both require careful planning, patience, and a focus on long-term strengths. The Russian court case is not just about money. It is a signal of policy. Russia wants to keep control of its microelectronics future. Whether that leads to a strong, world-class industry depends on what choices are made today. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, please take our channel membership, which is very affordable, to encourage us.